All right. It's good. Okay. Hey, all right. Welcome to Damascus Radio Series. This is week three of Berserker, which is a series on anger. Uh, we are recording this. We're going to upload this to our YouTube channel where we can watch and play it back later. Um, let's see. Uh, Mark Keen, are you, are you in the house? If you are, can I get you to pray and then read the uh, mission statement for us? <clears throat> I'm here. <laughs> you are? Yeah. I was just, I had to go grab something real quick to eat. <clears throat> we are kingdom warriors encouraging men daily to become fully armored disciples of Jesus. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you again for allowing us all to come together tonight and, and to glorify you through your word, and through your teachings, and through your guidance that you give us. Lord, we ask that You'll open, open our hearts to the message tonight and pour out the Holy Spirit on us. And give us wisdom and guidance and help us to move forward as you would have us to do. We ask in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Amen. All right, guys. Uh, series focus right now is uh, we're calling CCP Critical Connection Point. And uh, this is important because... You know, right now we've been under the stay-at-home order for a long time. We, I can already sense kind of a fragmentation of connection. Uh, and it's just really, really important to do everything you can to stay connected. If it's just one person, somebody, isolation is the killer. And the two biggest lies that we are constantly combating is that I'm alone in this and then I can do this on my own. And I love this picture that we put up this week of the two guys carrying the wounded guy in the stretcher. And Frank Stotts, who's one of our uh, Oklahoma City, Damascus guys, loves to say this saying. He says, some say Jesus is a crutch, and I say he's a stretcher. And uh, that's so true. Some of us are so laid out. We just really need our battle buddies to help us get to the meeting. This, pic this picture also reminds me of that story in the Bible where the they had the, the, their friends had to get the, their crippled friend through the roof uh, down to see Jesus. So they put him on a kind of a makeshift whatever, stretcher, ropes, and kind of lowered him down right where Jesus was because he couldn't get in the house. And this kind of reminds me of that. So be, be sure you guys are staying connected. Super important. So this begins Berserker third week where focus is on anger. Kind of the theme of the story is that anger in the battle of the mind begins with renovation of the heart. So we're on a journey to search our hearts. And tonight, the focus is being still and quiet and what that looks like. So we're going to run um, a video clip real quick. I'm going to give you, I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to give you a little background. So if, there's, if anybody's ever seen the movie The Last Samurai with Rob, uh, Tom Cruise, uh, Rob's going to share a clip from that and what it is is you've got a guy named Nathan Holmgren who is uh, he's uh, kind of got some post-traumatic stress disorder from the Civil War and Indian Wars and he carries a lot of pain and uh, bad memories from some of the things that he's done he feels pretty ashamed he's carrying around that guilt he's literally a man in the cycle of destruction uh, he's an alcoholic and he has been hired by the Imperial Army of Japan to train their soldiers fight the samurai and uh, he's captured in the first battle after it goes badly and for the first time in his life he's led into captivity and he's held in a place where he really can't move and uh this is kind of a clip to just kind of paint the picture and set the tone for being still so rob if you want to go ahead and okay so uh really great movie if you haven't seen it, it really is a great i mean the whole movie is a great picture of what we're talking about, how Tom Cruise really is the berserker who becomes the warrior of light. Now, we're not promoting Eastern mysticism and, and the whole belief of the Bushido code and all that stuff, but it does paint a picture of kind of what we're talking about, especially tonight we're talking about being still, being quiet. And he, this is, and I thought it's just a beautiful picture of, of what being still and being quiet can look like. Um, so, we're called not to be the berserker. We're called to be the warrior of light. The berserker, he's, he's ruled 
uh, by the anger in his heart. Uh, he's wild and out of control and he lives by his emotions. We are called to be warriors of light. And uh, we've got some attributes here for the warriors of light. And uh, I'm going to have uh, Steve, if you don't mind, would you read these attributes for us? You have to unmute yourself. It's all right. Uh, lives his life from a Christ-centered, fully healed heart. He is at peace with God, with himself, and others. He knows he knows who he is and knows his purpose. He is fully armored for the fight, not against flesh and blood, but against the dark forces in heavenly places. The warrior of light is ruled by his spirit, motivated by love, not his emotions. He has been trained in an atmosphere of daily stillness and quiet in the presence of Jesus. Thanks, brother. Yeah, we added the last one this week. He has been trained in an atmosphere, daily stillness and quiet in the presence of Jesus. Very, very important uh, for our discussion tonight. So let's do a quick review last week. The whole study, the Berserker study, is built on the foundation of 1 Timothy 1.5. The goal of this command is love that comes from or is issued from a pure heart, a clear conscience, and a sincere faith. And that's the place we want to get to. That's the place we want to be every day. The, most, the, most, the worst place that we can be as a Christian is in that place where we're locked up, where we have a storm on the inside of us, and we have to kind of wear that mask at church and with our friends and family and just... When they ask us how we're doing, we say, oh, we're doing fine, but really we're, we're tore up. We don't have that pure heart. We don't have that clear conscience. There's a battle within. Uh, last week, we were also asked to get some uh, three-by-five cards uh, and start journaling. I recommend that. And also, too, to, to practice, continue practicing the quiet time for five minutes a day. Uh, going to the white room, taking out the garbage, putting it away in the basket, and then meditate on James 4. 1 through 10, and we'll get a chance to talk about that in our breakout group later. Uh, last week was about the turn, turning away from sin, getting out, leaving and exiting the cycle of destruction. And we built that on 2 Chronicles 7, 14, Jeremiah 29, 13, uh, where basically you needed to admit your bad position, humble yourself, and leave the cycle of destruction. Stop, let go of those things that are hurting you, destroying you, draw near to God, and by doing so, you resist the devil because you're going in the opposite direction of where you were. And we run to the father. Uh, ideally, that's the story of the prodigal son. You know, as, as the son came over the horizon, the father ran to him to meet him. And that's, as we run to the father, he's running to us. And uh, we confess, or confess your situation, admit your shortcomings, receive forgiveness and a cleansing from all righteousness. And of course, last week was our first experience in the white room with the basket. You know, filling it up with all of our stuff, and we're gonna we're gonna visit that room again tonight. Here's a roadmap of the study that we're on week by week. Uh, we started off with the invitation, and then the turn tonight. We're in be still. Next week is a big one: expose your heart and the search factor that comes next, and later on, the small still voice, and then those encounters with Christ, where you can receive a new heart, get some healing. Tonight's focus. This is where we, we bring it all in for this evening's message, and that is today's focus is being still and getting quiet. And we have four scriptures here that, that uh, we're building this uh, message on today. The first is Psalms 37, 1 through 8, which uh, the theme of that is let go, worry, then trust, commit, be still and wait, refrain and restrain. And then 4610 is built on the hills of 30, Psalms 37, which says be still and know. And then Psalms 23, he leads me. And Hebrews 5.14, train daily and use continually. So let's jump right in, all right? All right, so uh, we're in the how to be still, Psalms 37, 1 through 8, the conditions for being still. What is required for me to be still? What's going to help that? And uh, Mel, if you could do me a favor, would you read uh, Psalms 37, 1 through 8, the scripture there on the left? All right. Uh, do not worry because of those who are evil or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. 
Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn. Your vindication like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret, it leads only to evil. Okay, thanks, Mel. Excellent. So here's just a quick breakdown of some of those things that he's talking about here. The first bullet point there is my eyes. What are my eyes and heart? What are they focused on? What has my full attention right now? Okay? If it's not God, it's going to be hard for me to be still. So I have to turn away, release all distractions, and fix my eyes on Jesus. That takes us to Hebrews 12, 2, which says, fix our eyes on Jesus, you know, the, the, the pioneer, perfecter of our faith. We, we fix our eyes on him. Peter, when he wanted to walk on water, he got out of the boat. And he was watching Jesus. He wanted to come to Jesus. So he's walking on water, but then he turned away. And he looked to the waves and the storm, and then he began to sink. And our eyes, when we want to be still, have to be fixed on Jesus, okay? If we're double-minded in any way, it's going to be hard to be still. So one of the first requisites for being still is that our eyes, we've removed distraction, and that's why we go away to a quiet place, right? Go somewhere quiet, turn off the noise, can't be disturbed because we're going to be fixed on him. Our eyes are on him. The second condition is the heart. Am I ready to give rule of my heart over to the Lord? Being content and thankful. You know, that's that's key. And you go to Philippians 4, 4, 4, 4, 4 through 13. It's not on here, but you can look it up. But basically, Paul is telling you the secret to being content and understanding how you protect yourself and how you have a right heart. And that's by having an attitude of gratitude, being thankful. Uh, I know that... Um, the other day I got up and, and I was kind of, my mind was kind of all over the place. I knew I needed to be quiet. I knew I needed to be still, but I had so much going on in my head and all these emotions were starting to get ignited, kind of like, like fireworks being lit up, you know, and to disarm all that, I just made a choice that I was going to just start thanking God for all that I had. I thanked him for my home and the grass in my yard and my wife and son and my car and air conditioning. I mean, I just thanked him for everything. And I thanked him until I ran out of things to thank him and I ended up at the cross and I thanked him for that. Thank him for saving me and all the things he's done for me and that he's never ever one time turned me away when I came to him humbly with my heart and hand. He's never turned me away. So your heart's a huge part of your condition. You know, if your, your heart's not all in, when you come into God, you're not going to be still. You're going to be divided. So another is your plans. Uh, if you want to be, you want to be still, you got to bring your plans and you got to surrender the success of those plans to Jesus. Release your expectations and your agenda. Give them over to him. You know, a lot of times I come to a meeting with God to get still. I say, okay, God, I'm going to stop talking now. I'm just going to be quiet and listen to what you have to say about everything going on in my life. That's it. No plans. I don't want anything. I don't want you to do anything. I just want to listen to what your plans are. So we got to surrender our plans. Another thing is you got to pick your, you know, pack your picnic basket. Wait for Jesus like I'm waiting for a dinner guest. You know, sometimes uh, we want to be still and really waiting patiently for him is the most difficult part. So you get still, you get your quiet place. And you're ready. You have all your carries, cares and worries. They're packed in a basket. You're holding them. You're being quiet. Now you're waiting on him. You're waiting. Patiently wait for him, it says. Be still, know the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Okay? And then another condition for being still is understanding, you know, ask that question. Why am I here? To turn from destructive behaviors and emotions, to meet with Jesus. So I can work on a plan to find out why I do the things I do. That's why you're there. Why are you there? Why are you being still? Why are you meeting with Jesus today? Because you know that there's things going on that need to be dealt with. 
and you need to be still in order to do this. So riding on the heels of that, let's talk about being still. And uh, this is this is a powerful Psalm 4610. It's not the whole verse, but this is the most important part of that verse for us. It says, he says, be still and know that I am God. So we have to we have to look at this and go, what does that mean exactly? So we're going to break it down into two parts. Be still and know. So let's look at be still first. So Psalms 4610, be still. Be still has three things that are important. Being still has a time. Being still has a place, and being still has a posture. So, Mark, I'm going to get you to help me on this. Uh, can you read under uh, being still has a time, Mark 135? Yeah, very early in the morning while it was still dark, Jesus got up and left the house and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. That's good. That's good. Keep your mic open. I'm going to have you read these other two in just a second. Yep. Um, <clears throat> Jesus got up in the morning. He knew where his he knew where his time was. And for us to be still, it's the same thing. I know there's a certain time of day that if I'm not up before that hour, it's going to be noisy around here. Okay, so I got to make sure that if, if I'm going to if I'm going to be still and quiet somewhere and meet with the Lord, I've got to have a, a, a time to do it that works. Sometimes for some guys, it may be late at night. Maybe you're a night owl, but you need need to have an appointment. All right, Mark, read the next one. Uh, being still has a place, Matthew 6, 6. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Okay, so it has a place, okay? And even in, in the first, Mark 135, you can see Jesus not only got up in the early, but he went off to a solitary place. And I think each one of us needs to have a place. Uh, I have my place right now, my back porch, until it gets too hot and the mosquitoes come out. Uh, I go outside, it's in my back porch, the birds are chirping and squirrels are running around. It's very green and pleasant. And I sit out there and I meet with God. That's my place right now. Uh, all right, Mark, go ahead and read the next one, Hebrews 4.15. Uh, being still has a posture. For we do not have a high priest who's unable to empathize with our weaknesses but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet we, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Okay. So when we to go to be still, we don't have to be anxious about it. Uh, matter of fact, when I was being still today, Coming in before this lesson started, just five minutes before you guys came in here, I closed my eyes, I started to get still and prepare my mind for this lesson. Jesus said to me, he said, there's no reason to be anxious in here. You know, so when I approach him, there's no anxiety that, that he's not going to show up. He's going to show up. He promises, we stand on his promises, that if we draw here, near to him, he'll draw near to us. So we can approach the throne with confidence. We don't have to have any doubt about that, that he's going to dismiss us or we're disqualified or we're not good enough to have a conversation with him. So being still, you can approach the throne with confidence. All right, second part of Psalms 46.10 is, and know that I am God. That's, a, that's important. That's a, it's a comforting security term here. He says, be still because you know. Okay, so what do, what do we need to know? First thing we need to know uh, is, uh, let's see, Rob, I'm going to have you help me read these, okay? Uh, what do we need to know first? We need to know that he loves me. And then we need to know that he's in control, and we need to know that my future is secure, okay? So to be still, I'm going to approach him with confidence and know some things. Okay, I'm going to have my time and my place, and when I have my time and my place and I approach the throne with confidence, I'm going to know that he loves me. So how do I know that? What does the Bible say about that? So Rob, I'm going to have you go ahead and read uh, James 4. Right. Uh, or do you think Scripture says without reason that he, that he jealously longs for the Spirit he has caused to dwell in us? And I want you guys to, to listen to that. Okay, I put up a video this week from Francis Chan. It was about 13 minutes long where he tore apart this verse in the most beautiful way. I want you to listen to these words, okay? Or do you think scripture without reason that he 
meaning God, jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us. God, the creator of all things, longs for me. Longs for me. He wants to have that meeting. He wants to meet with me. And I love this, knowing he loves me. This is Ephesians 3, 14 through 19. Listen to this. This is really good. I have a really hard time reading this without getting choked up sometimes. Paul writes this to the Ephesians. He says, for this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all of Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. So when we get still, we know that he loves us. And that as we come towards him, there's a promise that we're going to be filled of this fullness of God. This love is going to fill us up more and more and more. And you know what? There's no limit to it, and you can never measure it. There's no limit. You can't be so loved by God. You're like, I'm full, God. There's always more. And you know what? When you're topped off, that love only has one place to go, and that's to the people around. So we know he loves us. The second is, I know that he is in control. So, Rob, go ahead and read that, Matthew 6, 28. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Okay. So God is in control, man. Okay. He says, be still and know I'm in control. Be still and know I love you, and be still and know I'm in control. All right, Rob, read the last one, Jeremiah 29, 11, this famous verse that everybody knows. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Okay. He's, our future is secure in him. So I can lay down tomorrow and be still. I can stop worrying about tomorrow and the next day and next month and next week because I can, I can, for five minutes, I can lay it down and be still because I know that my future is secure. We're going to look at this next slide. This is Psalms 23. Being still and knowing Jesus and knowing that he's the good shepherd. And this is where it gets very, very personal. Everybody knows the 23rd Psalm. And it's huge. And I, you know, I'm, I'm just going to read it and just listen to it. Maybe you haven't heard it in a while, but I just want you to listen to it. In the, in the frame of being still and being quiet, I want you to hear this song. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not lack anything. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his namesake. And even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. Surely, your goodness and love 
will follow me all the days of my life. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Powerful, man. Just such a simple, simple psalm, but so powerful and so meaningful and, and right to the point to where we're at, you know? And that little breakdown, what is it? You know, in the, in the cycle of destruction, there's the, the part where the enemy prosecutes you and accuses you, and it's not too long if you stay in there that you start saying the I am statements, right? I'm a loser. I suck. I don't have what it takes. Well, here's some I am statements you can pull out of Psalms 23 from the Father. I am with the good shepherd. I am safe. He leads me to the best places for me. He mends my broken heart and gives me strength for today. I have all I need and more. I am satisfied. Love flows and peace reigns when I am with him. Totally different I am statement than the ones that the enemy wants you to have. So we're going to play another video clip here. Uh, Rob's going to pull it up in just a second. Um, Jesus calms the storm in me while the waters rage around me. And I love this picture. You guys, if you look close, do you guys see the man in the window, in the door? Can you see him in there? There's a little man in there. I mean, just think, I mean, I was like, this, this is the most, this picture says so much about that guy's condition. You know, it, it almost looks like his hands are in his pocket, like he's okay. Like he didn't care that there's this raging water around him. He is totally secure in that fortress, that little lighthouse right there. And for us, this is a picture of being still. Even though the chaos and the power of the raging waters is around us, we're secure because our house is built upon the rock. We're with Jesus. He is our good shepherd. We're with him. And uh, we're going to, I'm going to stop share. And Rob's going to bring up a video here in a second. I just want to set it up for you guys. Uh, if it's there, YouTube keeps taking it down because it's got a naked toddler in it. Uh, but if it's there, great, we'll watch it. But I just want to, to, for a second, to watch this video and just get a picture of being with Jesus when you're when the storm is raging, especially the storm that's raging inside you. Okay, go ahead, Rob. Sometimes uh, an image is. It just there's no words to follow it. That's the first time I watched this. I mean, I went through hundreds of videos looking for something that painted a picture of what we're talking about. About when I'm got a storm raging inside me, and I'm trying to get to that place, but I can't. And the first time I saw this video, I wept. And I go, I had to go outside and sit down for a bit and go, wow, what was that? Because it, the dude even looked like Jesus. I mean, he had the hood on thing, you know, it's like, it's just uncanny. And the reason it was powerful for me, because it was familiar. I've been in that place. Mad, angry, whatever. And... You watch the child in the video that he just, he goes and goes until he just is exhausted. And the father just patiently waits. Totally available, totally right there, just waiting. And then the end, it's just that moment where they're just one. And they're, he's holding his dad and it's just like, you know, this is where, this is what it is to be still. You come to the end of yourself and you just don't have anything left. So I love, before I go on, I'd love to hear you guys' thoughts a little bit. If you guys want to share what you, what you got out of that, just feel, feel free to unmute yourself.
Okay. Yeah, I thought it was. I don't think it was any accident that he looked a lot like Jesus. I'm with you on that one with the beard, the hood, um, everything. Um, I just looked at it as, as that I, I mean, it's, you, I've always heard things about when people say, you know, they, they've always been looking for you for looking for God, looking for Jesus. And his response is always, I was always here. I never left. I didn't move, you know, and I just, it was looking at right now. Um, I'm thinking about my youngest son a lot, you know, and the last time that we talked and we saw him, we saw him Sunday and, uh, and just holding him and giving him a hug, you know, and just letting him know that I love him. That's, that's what I got from that video, you know, that's, uh, and it just makes me think of how much I love my kids, you know, and how much does, does God love us, you know, to send his son to die for us. And it's just, um, it was a lot, you know, my, uh, we hugged for, it seemed like forever Sunday. And, and I just said, I love you. And, and he said, I love you. And that's all, that's all we said. And we just held each other. Until we stop crying, you know. Yeah, that's good. good. Anybody else? <clears throat> All right, I'll go on to the back to the deal. All right, good stuff. All right, so now I'll go to the kind of the next part. What do you do with all that stuff? So I know about you. But, you know, the, I, when I have those times with Jesus where I've come to the end of myself and, and he just, that powerful comfort that comes from that, and I, my batteries are charged. I'm ready to go. And that's the play. That's just, this brings us to our next part, which is, you know, what we do every day. This is an everyday thing. You don't spend one day a week with your kids, right? <laughs> you spend every day with your kids. It's the same with Christ, man. We just spend every day with him. I become the calm before the storm. I spend time with him. Hebrews 5.14 says this, but Saul proves for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves or trained their senses to distinguish good from evil. And that's what we're doing. Being still is an everyday event and a discipline. Couple that with God's word that sharpens my ability to know what is good from evil. It makes me more sensitive for what's good and what's evil. But it's every day. By its use, I begin to win battles that I thought were once hopeless, okay? So being still and being quiet is an everyday discipline. And it's part of our foundational habits. If you may go to Damascus for a while, you know we've got nine basic foundational, we've got nine habits. Two of them are foundational habits. And the foundation is always set before the building is constructed. Today's build starts with a good foundation. Today's build, my day, starts with prayer and quiet time, coupled with spending time in God's Word, renewing my mind. That's the foundation of every single day. Being still and being quiet is not an option. It's part of the foundation. You never build a house and skip the foundation, so why would you start your day and not spend five minutes getting still, getting quiet, Putting yourself in a place where you can hear from God. He can quiet the storm in, inside you. He can give you focus. He can give you wisdom and understanding. And you get into his word and you can renew your mind and you have thoughts and encouragements for the day. So here are our breakout questions. Since we have a small group today, um, I'm going to bring us out of here. 